it becomes compliance versus emotion. Yeah. Right. And what do I need to do to get to the next level of the game? Hi, I'm Matt, your host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to boost their ROI of their investments by paying attention to CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Joseph Michelli, who's a best-selling author and CX consultant. And I recently reviewed his book, Leading the Starbucks Way. He's also written a number of books about other exemplars like Zappos and Ritz-Carlton, Mercedes, Airbnb, and most recently, Mark Carey, uh, the telecom company in Australia. Joseph, thanks for joining us. And I really love the emphasis on culture in all your books. Well, Matt, I love your podcast. So uh, it's a shared admiration society. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, as we dive in, I, you know, all your books share a common theme um, about the importance of inspiring and engaging a company's employees. Really, the, the CX and culture intersection really goes through the passion and pride of all your employees, which is something that you write about, uh, and how everyone can play a role in strong, forging a stronger emotional connection uh, with customers. What are some of the key lessons learned across your books um, that you'd like to share? I'm glad you found that common thread because I, I think if it doesn't exist inside of an organization, it's pretty hard to sell anything outside of the organization, including passion or a commitment to service. So if leaders aren't serving their team members, they're probably not going to expect it to be a sustainable phenomenon to serve your customers. And I think the whole language of customers or employees is kind of a strange one, right? So I think one of the fundamental things is for us to think about people as having human experiences and humane experiences. And to the degree that we foster those inside of an organization, we have a greater chance for outside. And just a quick other takeaway on that is we have to define what it is emotionally we want people to feel, uh, whether we call those people employees or customers or vendors for that matter. So that's a theme that um, a number of our guests talk about, which is the, um, uh, the importance of emotion in customer experience, both B2C and B2B companies, and you know how people feel about themselves during the customer journey is so important for customer experience. You actually have a PhD in psychology. You know, how did you get to that uh, focus on emotion and culture in the customer experience? Well, first off, I heard a great podcast on your show about just the B2B issue. And I think, you know, often we don't think of emotion as relevant in the B2B comparative to the, the consumer. So I, kudos to you to identify that that's a driver in the B2B space, too. For me, as a clinical psychologist, it was inevitable we're going to talk about emotions and how people feel and all of that. But when I really focus more on systems and organizational behavior, uh, it became increasingly obvious to me that people are still operating as if they are individuals outside of an organizational system. We are driven to decision making by the limbic system, and we justify it through the frontal cortex. So, um, but when you get right down to it, you you know I think a lot of organizations haven't defined what is their differentiator on how they want every customer to feel every single time, no excuses. And so I kind of crafted a concept that, that I think I trademarked somewhere along the way called the way we serve statement. And it's kind of the inverse of your values, right? Like if we live our values, then what will the customer feel? And so often we talk about values like integrity, but well, okay, that's your integrity, but what will that, how will the customer feel, right? It increased sense of trust. Uh, is that an increased sense of nurturance? What, what does that look like? So I, I think that's the shift we make. In often when we talk about branding, people use language talking about the brand. They're defining the brand identity and the way the words you use are actually uh, it's a little bit selfish. People talk about the way they describe their brand. In customer experience, we use language to talk about how the customer feels. And what I love about um, about your books is that you've actually connected this to the employees by thinking about the behaviors that you want the employees to practice and how people show up. And those behaviors are actually what drive that emotional connection with customers on the journey. 
Yeah, this is a really great insight on your part, because if, if you think about brands in general, um, you know, let's pretend because you did such a great review for leading the Starbucks way. But let's pretend somebody's never been to a Starbucks and I say, hey, Matt, I want you to go to my favorite place. Like it's my favorite coffee place. It's Starbucks. And you go and you have a terrible experience and you come back to me and go, Joseph, I don't understand. It was sound, tasted more like Charbucks than it did like coffee. And um, and, you know, so I, I look at you and I go, man, who am I hanging out with? Who's this Matt guy? I mean, like I have a relationship with Starbucks and you're like violating my relationship. So I think there is a real strong emotional affinity. And sometimes we'll throw a person under a bus for our beloved brand. And love is a key concept. But when you get down to it, how do we drive it? Well, first, we have to tell our employees that that's what we want them to deliver. We have a certain emotional nurturance thing at Starbucks we want you to, to experience, that place between work and home where you really feel you belong. And so if that's what we're selling, then what are the behaviors we need to make it happen? Because unlike manufacturing, where all the raw material comes in the door exactly the same, we impose certain processes and we have a 0.001 defect rate on the backside. When it comes to dealing with people walking in that door at a Starbucks, they're coming in with such variability that we have to impose some level of standardization to try to drive towards some outcome. But we also have to empower our people to nuance the way they deliver it based on the uniqueness of the individual walking in the door. And in, in the book, you actually specifically call out um, four behaviors that deliver an exceptional customer experience, uh, anticipate, connect, personalize, and own, which um, I'd love to get your thoughts because you interviewed a lot of people, did a lot of research. How did Starbucks land on those specific behaviors and how do they reinforce that connection of the employees so that they can be empowered to deliver those, um, those unique experiences that are consistent with that brand promise? Well, I think in the it was in the old days you could just deliver what people expected and that was good enough. Um, I think in the world in which we live today, you have to anticipate what's about to come the next step. So I, I think it's a little future forward to not just meet needs, but to anticipate needs. And I think that's a higher level of service and a differentiator between those that satisfy and those that wow. So that was pretty obvious. Connection really. It, it, let's get honest, probably even more so now with all the AI and all the technology and all the self-serve options, when we do get a chance to make a personal emotional connection with somebody, it is a differentiator uh, in the space. Um, you know, and I think ownership of an experience is really what we want people to have. You are the creator of an experience. It's, it serves two purposes. First, rather than me just mailing it in and you not feeling any real humanity to it, it enables me to feel empowered as a, a creator of an experience. So I'm not just a coffee transactor. I'll hand you the coffee for the money. I am creating an experience. I have the power to maybe uplift a moment in your day, which is a qualitative, a qualitative difference from, say, the dry cleaner who tells you just hand them the stuff and get them out of here. And you actually write about this in, in your books, too, that this is intrinsic motivation of the people that they feel proud and this, this is something that connects to me um, in my background, having worked with the Katzenbach Center when I was at Booz and PwC on culture and change leadership, uh, that a lot of culture is about connecting with the pride of your people and having ways to reinforce that. And, and you can see in your books how these companies are creating cultures where people have natural drives to bond and learn and feel proud of their contributions. Yeah, you know, we look a lot at change management, and one of the things we often miss is uh, it's not just about the vision we paint for the future for people. It's the degree to which that aligns with the vision they have for themselves. And the more there is alignment between, hey, my calling, my purpose, my reason for being is synced up with what this organization can do, the more likely I'm going to feel pride and the more sustainable uh, any change effort is going to be. They're motivated and committed and it feels natural for them and it feels part of their identity and the community they're part of and they're all reinforcing. Yeah. And why would I want to go chase your dream if it doesn't fit my dream? And why am I going to make you money if it doesn't fit my life script, my narrative for what I think my life should be about? So how does Starbucks then tap into this deeper meaning? And as well as any of the other exemplars that you've written about, what do they do that makes them helps them tap into that deeper meaning? Well, I think Starbucks is an interesting one because, you know, their comparative set is quick service restaurants. So we are comparing against McDonald's and Burger King and, and whatnot. So uh, 
how much pride do you have as an employee of Starbucks versus how much pride do you pride do you have as an employee of McDonald's? I'll leave that for subject subjective evaluation. But I think most of us would guess that people have a sense of elevated service professionalism in a Starbucks relative to some of those other comparators. Um, and it should be a springboard to greater service in maybe other sectors, right? Like I, I am, was a great server at Starbucks and now I've been hired on to provide service excellence at some other organization. So, um, and, and you see that a lot. You see it for people who like work front lines at Nordstrom's who then go on and do amazing things because they had great training on what it means to create value for people in human interaction. Um, so I think almost all of these brands help people realize that service is a form of professionalism when done well, creates value for others. There are soft skills associated with there are, there are emotional intelligence skills associated with it. And the more I help you maximize those skills, the more value you're going to create in your lifetime. Um, and I, I think that's the key to this is to help people say service is not servitude. It's a skill set that is a springboard for leadership uh, and for making a huge difference in the world. And it is through creating value that we are valued. Seth Godin had a phrase that I really loved in Lynchpin, uh, which is to think of experience as a gift. Um, and that you think of your family and your friends. You were talking about that a moment ago when people's emotional connection, it's different with your family and friends. That's more of a gift mentality than a commercial mentality. And you, you feel that connection to them. You're, you're driven, you have purpose, it's meaning for you, it's part of a community. Um, and, and giving experiences like a gift. I love that Seth Godin said that. And for me, that was a fun connection too, personally, because my mom actually, as an artist, um, uh, said that um, uh, I should read this book, The Gift Economy, and read that and talked about it with her. And then Seth Godin wrote about the same book in his book. And so I like to say that my mom got there first because she told me about the gift economy before he wrote Lynchpin, but it's the same yeah. idea. Seth Godin Schmoden. We got your mom as the source of curated content. We don't need Seth. I love Seth, by the way. Yeah, he's got great stuff. And I, I that, that whole notion of gift giving and the service and building people feeling proud of it, it totally nails it. Well, so let me bring my mom into the mix then, if you're going to bring your mom into the mix. Um, so my mom said, you're not on this earth to be served, son. Like, And she made that really clear from childhood. And you're on this earth to serve. And in it, it is through your service to others that you will find value in your life. Um, and it's really been true. I mean, I, I sometimes resist it. And it's like, I want someone to take care of me. Nana, nana. But really, the more I focus on the extension of being able to create value for others, the more I feel good about myself and the more good things come to me. So I've, I've coined this phrase that service serves us. Um, and I really do think that that's kind of the gift of giving is the return that you get, not in a kind of, you know, kind of a mercenary kind of way. Just the very giving of something creates an open hand that allows you to, to receive. We all want to have impact, you know, in our work, in our communities, in our lives. And, and it, it's customer and employee experience is a great way to have impact. Um, now, when you, you know, you pick up on it in your book and there's been a lot written about how Starbucks is the third place. You know, there's work, there's home, there's Starbucks. But the Starbucks brand has actually evolved because, and uh, it's, and you talk about this in your book, that um, it's also present in people's homes now. It's present on the go. It's it's present at work. Um, so, how has Starbucks approach um, whether that transition or evolved as they kind of uh, you know look beyond the third place where that human experience is so essential to deliver the brand? Well, like Howard Schultz, Tate Howard Schultz as a political figure, as a leader in Starbucks, he had the vision when Starbucks was floundering a bit to say, hey, this idea of you having to come to our place is not customer centric, right? We need to meet you where you are. And so there's a whole principle in that book called Mobilize the Connection. So we wanted to take the connection that was formed in the context of this nurturing third place, affordable luxury coffee house and make it connect to you wherever you were. And at that time, they were doing things like Via, which was kind of freeze-dried coffee at the high end that you could pour your cantina water on the top of a 14,000-foot peak and enjoy Starbucks. So, you know, there isn't one on a 14,000-foot 
foot peak to my knowledge yet, but that's just a matter of time probably. But they wanted to make sure that you didn't have to go out of your way to get to a Starbucks, that it would be where you wanted to carry it. I think their brand probably benefited from being developed in the third place and was there more, more extendable. And they've done a good job of extending it, of extending the brand. And, and, and Schultz deserves a lot of credit for reinvigorating the brand in the locations. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, through the experience they're delivering, that's multi-sensory, human to human, all the things that make the Starbucks experience what it is. Well, given your background in terms of strategy and helping organizations understand the strategic path that's going to get them to where they are, I think that that's the kind of movement that someone like a Howard Schultz did. He found a new strategic path that did reinvigorate the brand and, and relevant to maintain its relevance. But to your point, and I think this is key to everybody who delivers experiences, whenever you get a chance to captive a captive audience of your customer, that's where your commercials pay off. So if I'm going to do a 30 second commercial saying this is how great my brand is, I get when you're in my coffee house for two minutes, I've got a two minute commercial going on in vivo. And that's where we prove out all those claims. So I think you're right. The in coffee house experience is where people felt the brand. And then you could extend it out through the digital media to say, hey, when you see that Starbucks logo, it's the felt sense of what you experience inside of the coffee house. And it's just showing up as an icon on your phone. In my own book, The CX and Culture Connection, which is also the name of this podcast, uh, we both share that passion about culture and how it connects to CX. Um, I actually used Starbucks as an example um, of uh, this concept I call the experience collage, which is, again, a connection to my mom, who's a collage artist. So this actually influenced my thinking. Experiences like collage artwork, it has many layers and you're putting pieces together. And in the experience collage canvas, I think of it as a space that has a two by two. Um, and it starts in the bottom left with functional experiences, which are important, but don't create a true emotional connection. And when you think about beyond the product, beyond the service experience, that's creating that deeper emotional connection, tapping into deep metaphors, the way the brain really works, a stronger bond individually. And Starbucks actually does a really good job of that through the multi-sensory experience and connecting with people. And they do that with the, the employees through how they connect to coffee culture and then share their love of coffee with people. But the multi-sensory experience gets you beyond the product. In, and then if you go up on the two by two, you go beyond the self to shared experiences. And uh, kind of good, better, best, if you go to the top right quadrant, it's community. And what Starbucks has really done so well is created a beyond the product experience with a community around their brand in the third place. And then that, that experience is such a powerful one. That's why I used it as an example in the book. And, uh, you know, I give it a few pages, you give it a whole book. It's really, I really um, loved reviewing your book for that reason, because I think it hit on so many of the important elements of why Starbucks is a good example for getting culture right. Yeah, just 15 seconds on that. I think the collage idea is so critically exciting. I mean, I've played it in terms of multiple levels of a chessboard, right? But the, the whole point is that we're not playing on a one-dimensional field here. We are playing on layered fields of meaning and depth and individuality to community. So it's a wonderful metaphor. I would encourage people to read your book just because of the power of that collage concept. Oh, thank you. And it's continuous. You know, and also the collage has meaning because you talk about it and share it with others. So it's a shared experience. Um, yep. in, in your book, you also talk about, you know, how um, the partners are so key to delivering the experience. What does Starbucks do to nurture that partner engagement and, and their role within the customer experience? Well, I want to, I want to, you know, do a, a little bit of a proviso here. You know, this is before the unionization efforts, and this is a long ago that I wrote this book. I think still relative to other players in the space, they were doing things like making sure that people had tuition credits. They were maintaining their health benefits for people at 20 hours. Um, the fact that, that, uh, Things may or may not have improved as a result of unionization is a reflection, I think, of just a changing workforce culture. But compared to the other players in the space, I think they've always 
cared about trying to build a stronger connection to their employees and the long-term growth and development of those employees um, relative to their sector. How important is it to their brand and their success from a kind of a leadership brand standpoint that they're able to tap into sustainability and caring about employees and some of these um, other aspects of that are may, are important to the employees, but also customers' connection with the brand too. So, how how important is that then to their leadership brand? Well, it's interesting because I've been to uh, you know the shareholder meetings and I've seen you know older people like me you know posing questions to leadership like why are you on such a sustainability agenda and you know I just don't understand it. Is that really contributing to profitability <laughs> and and very short term you know, investor mindset. And every time they just kind of come back, look, we're from Seattle, like we have a, we have a cultural ethos that's consistent with the, you know, the beauty of our region. We have a lot of young people who work in our environment for whom this is a compelling value proposition. And we ultimately believe that coffee is not going to continue to be harvested into the future unless we are able to sustain our resources with, you know, less pesticides and better water management, for example. So all of that said, I think that it's endemic to them to have a future pathway that is supportive of, a, of, of an environmental perspective, uh, even though, so, you know, and, and the, the, the end quote for most of these meetings is, and if you don't like our value system, you can go put your money somewhere else where you're more aligned with the values. We're just throwing off plenty of profit for you while also doing good for the world. So that's normally the, the end quote uh, at the, in response to these, these types of pushbacks. I think it is just who they are. A lot of the themes you're talking about um, came up in my podcast discussion with Norman Wolf, too, who wrote The Living Organization and also has a really strong connection to the energy of your employees in the organization or what makes the culture um, impactful and how people's connection to values and purpose is so important. And, and I would encourage people to like and subscribe and check out some of those other episodes uh, too, like, like Norman Wolf and, and others that you'll find that reinforce some of these themes. Um, I'd love to um, get your thoughts, Joseph, about any of the other books that you've done and your own experience that you think uh, share additional uh, insights that, you know, that build on what we've talked about. What are some of the other books that you think uh, and what were the key messages that build beyond the Starbucks lessons? So, you know, pretty much every book I write, I've consulted for the company. So I have some deep emotional connectivity to it. Everything from a Zappos where the, the late, great Tony Shea created this very quirky culture. Uh, and it was such a strong culture that Amazon wanted to buy them out by their growth curve. I'm writing a new book about an Amazon company called Amazon One Medical, which is on the healthcare side, a client I've consulted with. When you talk about things like the value structure, they're a very inclusive culture based out of San Francisco and inclusivity is at the core of what they do and it resonates with a new generation of, of employees. Um, I would say something like a Ritz-Carlton is a very gravitas-oriented culture where they really do reinforce culture through daily lineups and high cultural communication rituals. All of these things are connected to your theme, which is that CX cannot happen unless there's a strong cultural connection. And that strong cultural connection exists both internally to the people that create the culture of the business, but also the CX needs to connect with your target audience's culture. Uh, and you can't be all things to all people. You know, I think the problem with a lot of brands is there is no, there isn't, they stand for nothing uh, and they want to be everything. And today you better target the audience that is your tribe and stand strong on it, both internally and externally, and create a great experience for your tribe. Um, those are the ones that win in the market today. What I find really interesting I mean, all these examples is the um, they have unique branding positions and the behaviors of the employees that you want aren't the same. So these companies have to figure out, there's not one recipe for success of these are the behaviors you want. I'm sure there's some consistency, like you want people to be collaborative, you want people to have integrity, but the behaviors aren't the same, just like the brand attributes aren't the same. I'd love to get your thoughts on, on what's common across them and what do these companies do to identify behaviors that are unique to them? 
Yeah, you know, the the goals of a Nike are very different than a nurturing brand like a Ritz Carlton, right? A kind of competitive win sort of mindset. Um, and, and you wouldn't want to have the same experience at a Costco that you have at a luxury resort. I mean, the whole value proposition is predicated on creating, you know, choice and affordability, um, not necessarily an opulent experience. And you don't want to expend money on people who are going to, you know, be overly charming greeters in one of those environments. So I think the key behavior is linked to what do you want people to feel at the end? You know, do you want them to feel that they had ample choice? So they're, they're feeling like, wow, I'm smart. I went to a place where I got great choice and great price. That's very different than you want them to feel nurtured. And so the behaviors to nurture somebody are, you know, um, they're very different. I, I consult for the Wall Street Hotel in New York City, and it is it was like it was one of the best hotels in New York last year. And they spend time just picking up little subtle nuances of something they gathered from you and then activating it in a way that surprises and delights you. Um, at Costco, I just want to be able to sample something cool and unique, and I want them to know something about what I'm sampling so that I can find it when you know I want to consume it. Um, so it's a very different set of behaviors, and it should be consistent with the outcome you want your experience to drive. How do the what are some of the leading practices to build alignment around those behaviors so people have a shared understanding of what they are and then drive you know behavior adoption, drive habit building? Well, you know, a Ritz Girls is pretty good in that they carry a little credo card that says, here are our service behaviors. And they talk about them every week in a daily lineup. They tell stories around them. They actually have people in the organization who collect stories and link the stories to those behaviors. Um, and the, there's a, a certain cultural challenge to say, how can you deliver the same behaviors for the least amount of money for the customer? So it's almost like a competition of how can you create the greatest wow with the least amount, least amount of money with the most amount of behavioral creativity. Those types of things really inspire people to say, well, if, you know, if Matt's going to do it that way and he nailed it and he showed those behaviors, how can I nuance those behaviors to get even more of an impact in the lives of the people I serve? So I think you know, it is the storytelling, it is the ritualization of them, and it is the linking of behaviors line of sight. I, you know, really, what do I do every day that enables me to execute those behaviors to those outcomes? What I love in what you're talking about, Joseph, is, um, and I'm going to geek out a minute on this, is the um, informal organizational practices that you're emphasizing, not just formal organizational practices. Yeah, because you know, the formal ones are behaviors that you measure against performance, right? I mean, that's a very f formal strategy is like, here are the behaviors that you're going to be rated on however frequently. But I think we want to informally build the infrastructure. So the, the formal uh, would be things like, um, are there incentives? Are there KPIs and metrics? Things like that, that people think about. In, in, and there's those matter, but I think organizations, we probably both agree, companies tend to over-rotate on those relative to the informal if they really want to move their culture forward. And a lot of the exemplars that you're talking about, it's not that they don't have formal mechanisms, they certainly do, but they really get it right on the informal side which is the storytelling, the norms, the commitments, the mindsets, the, you know, the relationship networks. These are all the things that they're building that reinforce day in and day out the intrinsic pride people have in those behaviors, not the, just the formal mechanisms. Yeah, beautifully said. I mean, Tony Rob Robbins says that we're either changed for inspiration or desperation. I think the informal is the inspiration. I think sometimes we desperately just do what we're supposed to do so we don't get in trouble. It's a carrot stick sort of scenario, right? So like I have to do these things in sufficient quantity in order to get my raise or bonus or incentive. And I do it because of the game, not because of the internal. And one last thing I'll say about that, you know, we know a lot about uh, intrinsic motivation being extinguished by extrinsic rewards. So if I happen to love music and practice music all the time, and then you start paying me to practice, I often lose the intrinsic love of the playing of music and I replace it with the extrinsic. So I think it's important to make sure we keep both in play. It becomes compliance versus emotion. Yep. Right. And what do I need to do to get to the next level of the game? Yeah. Um, so 
you know, you you called out a number of ways to reinforce that um, habit building. Um, I will also suggest to the audience, if you want more on this, check out the podcast uh, with Chris Taylor, the CEO of Actionable. Chris um, has a great company, Actionable. It's one that I use myself to really build habit building loops with companies and really think about what are the behaviors you want and how do you actually track commitments and uh, follow through on behaviors, uh, which is really necessary. Like if you want to go build strength, you go to the gym, you build habits. So ultimately it's the psychology that matters to make this work, which is, um, you know, what I find so fascinating in your work, Joseph. Yeah. It, it, you know, we have lots of commitments, <laughs> you know, we're willing to make those commitments on January 1st and lose them by January 4th. So it is about forming habits and, and developing tools that reinforce those habits. Now you actually started your career in radio. Um, I'd love to hear, like you know, given your experiences there, how did that influence the path you've been on, and and what what are some of the things you learned from that and that have stuck with you? Yikes, Matt! You remember my radio days? No, um, you know, I I think other than trying to sound like you have a lower voice than you do, a couple of other lessons from radio probably was that you know I did afternoon drive in Colorado Springs for a decade, so two hours a day, people were driving home at a time when radio was really big, when we didn't have a lot of other streaming services or on-demand audio. Um, you really had to engage your audience. You had to make them want to stay in their driveway for, you know, to pass that next 30 seconds of commercial to see what you were going to say on the backside. And I think for me, it was always imagining who is my audience? What is their need state? And how can I connect with them in a way that serves that need state. And often it's transitioning out of their crazy day, wanting to know a little bit about a, about the world, but also have a little bit of fun and a little bit of joy on the drive home uh, and a distraction from the traffic. So once you understand kind of what your what done looks like, to use a Brene Brown term, and then you reverse engineer the experience to try to approximate that for your core audience. That, that's what I learned. And I think it's, it's applicable to what I do every single day is like, what does done look like and how do I help you get there? What are some of the, um, you know, for companies that want to, um, get on their own path and people want to get on their, their own journey, if you will, to be better at customer experience and culture. What are some of the best ways for them to get started um, and build that muscle, build that acumen? I think, you know, it starts kind of back with that way we serve statement. I would love for you to think if you're in leadership right now, if you asked every single person on your organization, what do you want customers to feel every single time? Um, how certain are you that you're going to have a universal answer? It's not that they're not going to have really positive things. It's just that they're going to be very different things. And the more different they are, the less branded you are in the experience delivery. So I think defining true north on what you want every customer to feel every time is pretty critical. I think once you've done that, I think it's really important to say, okay, who are our core customers and when do we want to make sure that they feel those things? Because the truth is we can't do that every single moment, every single time, but we have some high value moments that are going to be memorable. The behavioral economics research tells us it's arrivals, it's transitions. You know, there, there are places, there are ending moments that are particularly important. So let's identify those moments. Let's make sure we infuse it through people, process, and technology so that people walk away from those high value moments saying, wow, I felt this uh, thanks to the technology, the people, or the, or the processes. Um, if you do that, you're way ahead of the game. And then obviously you want to measure at the right moments to understand how well you're doing. You also are measuring not only on the quant, but you're measuring on the qual to, you know, to understand how can we do it better, where the levers we could throw that would ensure even a greater sense that the branded emotion is, is present. If all that happens, you're going to get repeat business. You're going to get referrals. Uh, and you know, you can use things like NBS and MPS to predict the likelihood that you're going to have repeat business. But I think as long as you're generating the emotions that are congruent with your brand, uh, you're going to be okay. You, you just used a magic word there, which is congruence, which is, um, what a lot of what we're talking about here is how do you reinforce the congruence of your customer experience and your brand? that if your CX has certain elements to it, you're trying to deliver the right emotional peaks along the journey through the right behaviors, that that should be congruent with the brand you want. And what's really cool now about a lot of the insights and measurement is you can actually listen better to whether the experience is congruent. That's been an area 
that I've seen a lot of companies pioneer is how do you actually measure whether the experience is congruent with the brand promise across a number of these emotional elements that you want? Absolutely. And one of the cool parts now is you're seeing people actually remove elements that are not congruent. In the old days, all we kept doing was adding more and more things, thinking that if we, you know, if we could get above the noise, you'd really see our brand. But we just cluttered these experiences with stuff and signs and messaging. So I think you're seeing a cleaner, sleeker experience that really all it really does create that confluence, right? That that merging together in the same river that that you want to go downstream with. Great design thinking, um, which is less is sometimes more. Um, yeah. Well, Joseph, I've really enjoyed our conversation. It sparked a lot of great ideas for me. Um, and I know it has for the audience. If, if folks wanted to get in touch with you, um, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? And, and what are the types of things that you, you know, you're looking that you tend to get engaged with with people? Is it is it to to be a keynote at their conference? Like what what's the best way for them to engage you? Well, I'm shamelessly available in every platform, it seems like, with just my name. So if you can spell my name, you can find my website, you can find me on LinkedIn and so forth. As for what it is I do, I'm I, I really try to stay kind of at that developing the CX culture level. Um, I certainly do journey mapping if that's needed on a consultative basis, but most of the time I am trying to help audiences benefit from the insights of many of these brands. Um, so if you want to try to understand the, the wide swath of how organizations have been trying to manage this and what are the pathways that are likely to get you to the end of the maze, um, then I'm likely to do that for you on a keynote uh, or as a workshop. But uh, we certainly write the book. So, you know, please continue to read the books that we put out there about these brands, because I do think they help you benchmark your own your own journey. Thanks so much, Joseph. Have a great day, everybody.